Well, hello. Um, we are up to Lecture 5 in History 362, African American History. And today I'm going to be talking about one of the most important leaders of the African American community at the turn of the 20th century, Booker T. Washington, who really sort of encapsulates one of the um, one of the strategies or tactics that African American leaders used in the late 19th and early 20th century to try to uplift the community, and that was the idea of respectability and the strategy of accommodation to white preferences. So. Um, Washington represents one end of the spectrum of caring about what white people thought. Um, du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois, who we'll talk about in a later lecture, probably represents the polar opposite, but there are other thinkers along this spectrum who we will also be considering. Much of what we know about Booker T. Washington's early life comes from um, his uh, autobiography, Up From Slavery, which was published in 1901. And Up From Slavery isn't meant only to be an autobiography, it was also meant to be sort of a self-help text <clears throat> indicating to African Americans the way that they could personally uplift themselves through economic self-sufficiency. And so he was using his own personal life story as a a kind of indication of what was possible. He was born into slavery in 1856 approximately, we're not sure exactly, in Franklin County, Virginia. So since slavery ended in 1865, um, he ends up for the first nine years of his life being in slavery. Um, after being emancipated, his mother and stepfather and two half-siblings moved to West Virginia, but Booker T. Washington lived his entire life in the South, which is kind of important as we're gonna see when we compare him and his strategies with those of some other African-American leaders who um, lived in the North. Okay, so as I said, uh, Booker Washington moved to West Virginia with his family after 1865. He was put working, uh, put to work packing salt in a, uh, in a salt mine. Later he worked in a coal mine. This is all before he hit his mid-teens. Despite the fact that he had been born into slavery, he was really, really ambitious to become literate. And he was encouraged to read by his mother, even though she didn't know how to read. Um, he also worked for the family uh, that owned the coal mines. He went into service, domestic service, in their household around the age of 11. Viola Ruffner, who was the wife of the guy who owned the coal mines, was a very hard taskmaster, very insistent on the values of hard work and cleanliness and thrift, and he really, uh, on the one hand, learned how to clean a house super well, which will be important in a moment, and also um, kind of had a bond of affection and respect with the Ruffners um, due to working directly for them. I just want to point out to you that on the, in the picture here, we see a schedule of the um, individuals who were held in slavery in that one particular family and how much they were worth, what price could be fetched for them, and the second to the bottom says, one Negro boy, Booker, $400. So there is Booker Washington and the rest of uh, his family members and other people that lived on the plantation with him. Okay, well, one day Booker Washington heard two miners talking about how there was a school, a kind of secondary school for African Americans in Hampton, Virginia. And this was 500 miles away from West Virginia where he was working. He didn't have the money to get there. He managed to scrape up a tiny amount of money from his family and friends. And so he mostly traveled on foot working his way as he went. When he got to Hampton Institute, 
he only had a few cents in his pocket so he couldn't pay for the tuition but the registrar of the place asked him okay go ahead and clean this room and he thought okay well this must be some kind of a test to see whether I should be admitted to the school or not so he cleaned and dusted the heck out of that room until it was spotless and the registrar said okay well I'll let you in as a student if you work as a custodian to put yourself through school Hampton Institute was founded by the guy on the right of the screen Samuel Chapman Armstrong he believed that the way up for African Americans would be through Christian moral teaching on the one hand and practical instruction and in, in manual skills and everyday routines on the other um, Chapman's experience included leading a black regiment during the Civil War uh, but he you know had his own ideas about how the black community was going to um, become self-sufficient and they included sort of manual labor and moral instruction students at Hampton learned how to farm how to make bricks how to build tables how to make shoes how to keep a household um, everyone was issued a toothbrush so it was pretty patronizing and it didn't include Hampton at first didn't include any of these sort of higher subjects of a liberal arts education that you would expect um, Booker Washington graduated from Hampton in 1875 at the age of 19 and he had a few years there where he taught on and off at various um, schools in the south that catered to African Americans was a little bit rootless kind of having a hard time finding a place to stay permanently but Washington or Armstrong came back to Washington and said they're going to be starting a new what's called a normal school or teaching college for black students in Tuskegee Alabama and I think Booker T that you would be a good principal for this now when Washington got to Alabama to accept his post he found that this thing only existed on paper the school had two thousand dollars that had been allocated for teacher salaries but there wasn't actually a piece of land involved there weren't buildings so Booker T Washington was able to use his personal charisma to get donors in the Tuskegee Alabama community to give loans that he used to buy land and he also had the students build the school buildings as part of their service to the school while they were there so by the time he died early in the 20th century Tuskegee Institute covered 2,000 acres of land had a hundred buildings had a faculty of nearly 200 people all of whom were African-American which is kind of interesting and unusual for this time period and an endowment close to two million dollars one of the big uh, philanthropic organizations in the late 19th century was uh, Andrew Carnegie's foundation they build a lot of libraries there are Carnegie libraries in many many towns and cities including Las Vegas New Mexico there's a nice one but on the Tuskegee campus there was also a Carnegie library and that is what is depicted here here are some of the students and faculty at the Institute the students I believe are um, in the lower right hand corner the upper left corner includes some of the faculty among whom was George Washington Carver the famous um, agronomist uh, and in the top right hand corner you see other faculty members and their families including women faculty members the curriculum at Tuskegee included some 30 subjects and these were manual labor subjects like printing cabinetry farming cooking and sewing along with grammar and composition history math chemistry bookkeeping there is also a big emphasis placed on personal hygiene on moral development uh, everybody had to attend chapel services daily by 1915 Tuskegee Institute had more than 1500 students as you can see here they also had sports teams this is the basketball squad 
but football was more important at that point. I could not find a picture of the football team, even though I looked. Tuskegee Institute became kind of a center or a think tank for other projects that were of interest to or importance to the African American community. So, for example, there were Negro con conferences held starting in 1892 um, that sought solutions for impoverished black farmers through crop diversity and education. The National Negro Business League, founded in 1900, was a um, kind of a, a lobbying organization or a membership group for um, black businesses, publicized their successes, helped people start businesses. And then National Negro Health Week called attention to minority health issues uh, nationwide. So quite a lot of things to come out of Tuskegee. By the mid-1880s, Washington was becoming a fixture on the nation's lecture circuit, and he really liked to lecture because it helped him to raise money for Tuskegee, and also allowed him to become a very vocal advocate in favor of his own philosophy of racial advancement. He gave an address to the National Education Association in Madison, Wisconsin in 1884, but he said what's important is education for black people on the one hand, but separate but equal facilities for African Americans on the other as long as they were really equal. So this kind of um, speech encapsulated the accommodationist racial policy that he would preach for the rest of his life. As racial insults and lynchings and stuff like that happened, he would find ways to downplay them he courted Southern white politicians who were racial moderates. He said, yes, you know, African Americans need to work hard and have good citizenship and elevated character to win the respect of the better sort of whites. Okay, so he's really shooting for respectability with the end goal being that white people will somehow through this stop being racist. The high point of Washington's career as a spokesman for the black community occurred at the opening of Atlanta's Cotton States and International Exposition in September 1895. Now this was one of a number of fairs that was held to celebrate what's called the New South, capital N, capital S. Um, the New South involved trying to industrialize, trying to make larger farms and to rationalize production. African Americans had their own segregated exhibit space at the exposition, and Atlanta leaders invited Booker T. Washington to give a 10 minute address. He spent a lot of time writing this address and he gave it on September 18th, 1895. The speech has come to be called the Atlanta Compromise because it was intended to um, tactfully impress all members of the audience Northern whites, Southern whites, African Americans from the South. Washington had said all of this before, but never as succinctly and never before such an important gathering. He said a couple things. First of all, that African Americans really needed to, before they thought about political equality or social equality, they needed to think about economic hard work. But he said to Southerners, cast down your buckets where you are. Remember that one third of um, Southern workers are African-American. You should hire African-Americans because this is the way that you're going to lead to the uplift of the black community. On the other hand, he said segregation we can live with. He urged people not to push for integrated facilities, not to push for civil rights. Quote, the wisest among my race understand that the agitation of questions of social equality is the extremist folly and that progress and the enjoyment of all the privileges that will come to us must be the result of severe and constant struggle rather than artificial forcing. Um, the most famous thing that he said, the climax of his speech, was the memorable utterance, quote, in all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers yet one as a hand in all things essential to mutual progress. 
So to put it another way, um, African Americans were okay with second class status in the short run, according to Washington, as long as white people remembered that the South couldn't succeed economically without um, black workers. This appealed to white people's idea of the American dream in the 19th century, the notion that everybody could pull himself or herself up by their bootstraps. And so he was really the most celebrated uh, black person from the, from the perspective of white people at this point. Symbolically, in 1895, by giving the speech, he was accepting the torch of leadership from Frederick Douglass, the former slave turned abolitionist, orator, journalist, who had died a few months before Washington spoke. So this uh, is an important speech for a number of reasons. The decade after 1895 was for Booker T. Washington the most influential period of his life if you look at demand for him as a speaker or look at the people who he influenced. In 1898, President McKinley paid a visit to Tuskegee Institute. And then after McKinley was shot, Theodore Roosevelt uh, worked closely with Washington. After taking office in 1901, he invited Booker T. Washington to dinner at the White House. And they had dinner and other African-Americans had visited the executive mansion on occasion, but this was the first time that an African-American had sat down to dinner with a with the U.S. president since um, since Lincoln, basically, and Southern newspapers just were outraged that a black person um, came to dinner at the White House. Washington was very upset about the negative press coverage, and Roosevelt privately said, "I am never inviting a black person to the White House," and he didn't. When William Howard Taft became president. Um, Booker T. Washington had a lot less success. Uh, Taft was much more reluctant than Roosevelt had been to make significant black political appointments. Um, but he did wield, Booker T. Washington did wield more power than any other African American of his day. Now, Washington led kind of a double life. On the one hand, he had his public life, which included, as I said, being a very sought after public speaker. He wrote many articles and 10 books, although many of his books were written with the help of ghost writers because he had a super busy schedule. He reinvested most of the money that he gained from his speaking tours and his books into Tuskegee Inf uh, Institute. He also had all kinds of important contacts that he used to elevate Tuskegee and to kind of keep other schools from being comp uh, competitive with it. He worked with white politicians, um, making sure that his supporters got political appointments and then kept other schools out of the area. He planted spies and organizations that were unfriendly to him to report on their activities. And he even had some newspapers that he owned a substantial share of do reporting that would be favorable to him and against people with different views about the future of the black community. All right, so this stuff went on. He's a very public booster of himself and his own projects. But the other part of his double life is he worked behind the scenes for civil rights. And this is something that historians didn't really know about until the past few decades. Beginning in the mid 1880s and lasting for over 20 years, he maintained a secret relationship with the editor of an African American newspaper called the New York Age. T. Thomas Fortune was the editor of this and there is the picture of Fortune there. He supported the newspaper financially. He was one of its stockholders and he was able to bankroll Fortune's agitation in favor of civil rights. So Fortune became kind of Booker T. Washington's secret mouthpiece on civil rights. Fortune had founded something called the Afro-American League. It was a civil rights organization and he supported that secretly. 
He bankrolled court challenges to state laws that were um, oppressive to African Americans. Uh, he challenged all white juries in Alabama, the disenfranchisement of black voters. He even played a secret role in the successful effort to get the Supreme Court to overturn a harsh peonage law under which a black Alabama farmer had been convicted. So he was working very hard behind the scenes. Um, he refused to go public with such efforts though because he thought it would undercut his support from white politicians and philanthropists and maybe threaten Tuskegee Institute. Um, so hardly anybody knew that he was up to this. Um, as a result of the fact that his civil rights involvement was secret, he was heavily criticized by people who were more active in the civil rights movement. I'm going to be talking about William Monroe Trotter uh, another day, but Trotter was a Boston politician who was very much against the screening of one of the most racist movies of all time, the 1915 film Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith. He was also critiqued by W.E.B. Du Bois, who was an emerging African-American scholar with a very different view of the best way forward for the black community. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a series of essays that were published as a book called The Souls of Black Folk in 1903. And he has a whole chapter in there criticizing Washington, saying, you're shooting too low. The African-American community needs to have its own leadership, and the only way to do this is allowing what Du Bois called the talented 10th, the 10th part of the black community that could go on to um, a liberal arts education, to allow them to be fully educated in um, tertiary education, to go to a school that didn't just teach hands-on kinds of materials, and those professionals could then fight discrimination and injustice. Now, Washington, as the uh, 20th century continued, um, began to seem like a guy who was behind the times because things were not improving. Accommodationism was not actually causing racism to disappear. There was the uproar over the dinner with President Roosevelt. But even worse than that, in September 1906, there was a terrible riot in Atlanta. Uh, white people attacked black people over a five-day um, five time period. When the violence subsided, 10 African Americans and one white person were dead. Many other African Americans were injure, injured. Um, black areas of the city of Atlanta had been completely destroyed. And Booker T. Washington's response was to say, exercise self-control, um, don't compound the lawless white behavior with violence yourself. Um, he did bring leaders of both races together after the riot to begin the healing process, but all that accommodationism didn't do anything to prevent the riot to begin with. Also in 1906, in Brownsville, Texas, um, an undetermined group of people shot up an area of the town of Brownsville. Uh, one white man was killed. And the racial climate was already pretty strained due to previous attacks on soldiers by local residents. So townspeople assumed that the soldiers, who were African American, had done the shooting in retaliation for the previous attacks. All of the black soldiers who were posted in Brownsville at Fort Brown said, hey, we didn't do it. There was no compelling proof of their guilt. There was no evidence. President Roosevelt decided to respond to the shooting by dismissing dishonorably three companies of black troops, creating an uproar among African Americans and among uh, more social justice uh, oriented white people. In Washington's later days, um, the movement to be more insistent on civil rights picked up. Um, T. Thomas Fortune broke with Washington saying, you know, you're not really doing enough. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, which will become one of the most important organizations in the first half of the 20th century for challenging racial oppression, was founded. 
Washington didn't participate at all in the NAACP founding meeting, but he did have a, a spy planted there. Du Bois became one of the leaders of the NAACP. He became the editor of its magazine. Washington didn't want to really get involved with the NAACP, even though that was where that was going. An incident that took place in New York City in March 1911 shows that even somebody of the stature of a Booker T. Washington didn't have a lot of protection under certain circumstances. Washington was inside the vestibule, the you know, lobby of an apartment building, and he was searching in the residence directory of the uh, apartment building for a friend's apartment. And while he was there, he was assaulted by a white man who lived in the apartment complex. Henry Ulrich, the assailant, first claimed Washington was a burglar. Then he said that, okay, Washington was looking through the keyhole of a white woman's apartment and that he had made an improper advance on Ulrich's wife. Washington charged him, Ulrich, with assault. And the trial got a lot of national publicity. The black community was supporting him. Even his critics were supporting him. But despite overwhelming evidence that Ulrich did it, he was acquitted. So this showed you that even somebody of the stature of a Booker T. Washington could not get justice in the society of early 20th century America. When I read about this, this reminded me of the event that happened during Obama's presidency when the very esteemed Harvard professor of history, Henry Louis Gates, was roughed up on his own front porch when he was locked out of his house by a Cambridge police officer who assumed that this African-American man couldn't possibly live there. And, you know, Henry Louis Gates tried to show him his Harvard ID and everything, and the policeman was having none of it. Ultimately, Obama intervened and sat down with the two men um, after all this happened, and they had a beer together. But I think the Gates affair goes to show you that still African-Americans have a hard time um, getting getting justice in the American um, judicial and police systems. Um, Washington died of overwork and hardened arteries shortly after that, but his legacy, his legacy is interesting. His legacy is a little bit ambiguous. Um, his secret life as a civil rights supporter began to emerge in the 1960s as scholars began to look at the one million documents in his collected papers, they showed on the one hand, here's a guy who's very secretive, manipulative, vain, um, who enjoyed living a double life, but who really was secretly committed to civil rights. To most of his students, to the faculty at Tuskegee, he was considered to be uh, almost godlike a kind of Moses leading them out of slavery and into the promised land. And he tirely preached a kind of upbeat, optimistic view of the future. When persons asked me, he said once, how in the midst of what sometimes seem hopelessly discouraging conditions, I can have such faith in the future of my race and my country, I remind them of the wilderness through which and out of which a good providence has already led us. He also wrote that he would quote, Permit no man, no matter what his color, to narrow and degrade my soul by making me hate him. And he was probably sincere when he said this. He believed that good citizenship, patient fortitude in the face of adversity, hard work, and love would finally overcome racism. And his emphasis on love and the sort of beloved community foreshadows a similar message by Martin Luther King Jr. that we will be talking about. Washington's up from slavery background made it difficult for him to communicate with or contend with critics like Trotter and Du Bois who were from the North. They in turn didn't understand the constraints that were on him as a man who had to live in the South and deal with white people on a daily basis. So, you know, he was a guy who is very ambiguous, 
um, not the bad guy that he was often painted as during the civil rights movement, a much more sort of nuanced figure um, than he used to be portrayed as, but definitely somebody who it's worth remembering um, as we look at African-American history.